I am here to change your mind about legal education because learning law is your most powerful tool for social change. It is not a mystery that in the United States our legal system is in crisis, but all our attempts to fix it have been failing. And there is a reason for this. It's not because we're not trying, it's because we, we as a people don't understand what inside the law allows for bad things and inequities to happen and the technical knowledge <clears throat> to fix the problems themselves. So, so what we have in the United States is a, is a legal educational system that is exclusive and exclusionary. This means that only a few people get it, and most people never have access to legal education. 200 years ago, if you wanted to be an attorney, an attorney would have to pick you and treat you like an apprentice. So attorneys like myself would choose the next generation of attorneys. Eventually, we began to form law schools, but these were just for, for white men of a certain economic class. Now, our law schools are graduate professional schools, and this has a very particular impact that I wanna, I wanna walk you through the numbers for. So, <clears throat> law schools will only take you if you have graduated from high school. So out of all our population, a smaller number of people graduate high school. Then law schools will only take you if you've graduated from college. So a smaller number of people go to college and even fewer graduate from there. Law schools then, as a graduate professional school, will take uh, part of the, the group of people who want to apply to grad school, but they don't take everybody. You actually have to have been in the top 20% of your class in order for a law school to look at your application. So 80% of those people go away. The next grouping is you're still not able to go to law school until you take a national standardized test where you have to score in about the top 30%. So 70 more percent of those people go away. Now you're in law school, but you're not an attorney yet. You have to finish, and an even smaller number of people finish law school. You're still not an attorney because you have to pass a bar exam, and a smaller number of people still pass the bar exam. Once you're a licensed attorney from this very small group of people in our society with legal education, we draw judges. Judges are licensed attorneys and there are very few of them in the United States. From this pool, we also draw our lawmakers. So governors, presidents, vice presidents, senators, Congress people at both the state and the federal level, <clears throat> many of them over our history have been licensed attorneys, all attorney generals are lawyers, right? This group of people does not go back and teach school. They don't teach grade school, they do not teach middle school, they do not teach high school, they don't teach community colleges, they don't usually even teach at the university level. So, so what we have is one of the greatest unknown social inequalities of our time, which is a legal educational system that enforces ignorance of the law and makes us unable to change the system. So what's the solution to this? Learn the law. That's the solution to this. And as a law professor, what I want to do today is to walk you through uh, sort of the story of civil rights to see how civil rights in our country are interconnected. And I want to use marriage equality to do it. <clears throat> now, marriage equality is something that's very near and dear to my heart, as my husband will tell you. But it didn't come out of nowhere. It actually developed over a 200-year period of time. So I want to I want to take seven steps on our journey together today to explore these civil rights. On the first step, we're going to take a look at the Constitution and Bill of Rights. This is a very short step. All right, the, there's lots that happens here, but in the in the Constitution and Bill of Rights, I just want to pull out the right to vote, a really basic right, but it only applies to white men. We go forward in time, and we get the the post Civil War amendments, also called the Reconstruction amendments. Right, in these amendments, there's three of them that are important to us. The 13th Amendment uh, abolishes slavery. The 15th Amendment uh, creates the right to vote for black people, which now we recognize as black, indigenous, and people of color, but not at that time. The 14th Amendment for civil rights laws is really important. It does two things. <clears throat> the first thing it does is it makes us citizens of the United States and citizens of the state in which we live. The reason it did this is because the federal constitution will provide a baseline, a baseline of rights that states cannot go below. 
This way, states couldn't reinstitute slavery after the Civil War. So, uh, so that standard uh, baseline for rights means states can give you more rights, just not fewer than the federal constitution provides. The other thing we want to pay attention to in the 14th Amendment are two clauses, the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause. The Equal Protection Clause means that similarly situated people should be treated similarly. Right? It's, a, it's kind of a tic-tac-toe board with a, a line straight across. The Due Process Clause means that you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. The word liberty is absolutely key in understanding how civil rights develop because it's the basis for a lot of the rights we recognize today. So let's take our next step. All right, step number three. We are going to 1920 in the First Amendment. This is when women get the right to vote. And this in combination with the 15th Amendment, where black people get the right to vote, or black men in particular, right, tells us something very interesting about law and rights. You can get a right, but that's different from being able to exercise the right. right? A lot of what happens with the, first, with the 19th Amendment <clears throat> has to do with intersectionality between race and gender and class. Not everybody who gets the right is able to exercise it at the same time in history. There's a lot of pushback and resistance to it. That resistance to the establishment of a civil right actually brings us forward in time to the next step. Now we're going to 1964 with the Civil Rights Act. This is a statute, all right? Our laws are made up of the Constitution, statutes, and cases that interpret and apply the law, as well as create rules themselves. So this statute is here to help people exercise their rights. It's an anti-discrimination statute. And you may recognize something like Title VII, all right? If you've heard of Title VII, that's an anti-discrimination statute for employment law. It means that employers cannot discriminate on the basis of sex, right, or on the basis of race. There's a lot of other categories that have developed into Title VII protections, right, like, uh, like religion, or national origin, or disability, or age. But we won't talk about those. We're gonna focus on, on uh, equality here for race and equality for gender and take our next step across time. We're gonna to go to 1967. This is Loving v. Virginia. There were 16 states uh, in 1967 that outlawed or prohibited uh, interracial marriage. That's a lot of states prohibiting marriages between races. What the court did in this case was to use the 14th Amendment, the due process clause with the liberty, with the word liberty in it, and the equal protection clause to say that states could not prohibit interracial couples from marrying. It also recognized <clears throat> marriage as a fundamental right. And in our, in our climb towards marriage equality, this case is key. We now take our next step. This is 1973 with Roe v. Wade. We're talking about this a lot this week. In Roe v. Wade, this case is not what most people think it is. Right? In the popular press, Roe v. Wade is considered to be a pro-life versus pro-choice case. But in the law, this case is a balancing act between a woman's right to privacy in her own body as an articulation of her liberty interest under the 14th Amendment and a state's right to regulate the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens, however that state deems uh, effective. Right, so they're not, they're not two rights that negate each other. They're two rights that, that one will be dominant at one point in time, the other will be dominant at a different point in time. In, in Roe v. Wade, they basically said, look, in the first trimester, the woman's right to privacy has to dominate. In the third trimester, the closer you get to viability or a fetus surviving outside the womb, the closer you get to the state's interest being dominant. The battlefield is over the second trimester. But the battlefield is actually now over the right to privacy, which we'll talk about a little later. But from here, <clears throat> we take the next step to 1970, or excuse me, yes, uh, to 2003. Right? In 2003, in the case of Lawrence v. Texas, the Supreme Court overturned laws in states that criminalize same-sex sexual relations or intimate relations. Um, there were many states that still had this on there. Texas was one of them. And the Supreme Court said, look, there is a right to privacy 
that LGBTQ people have in their intimate relations with each other that the government cannot interfere with. So under the right to privacy, those laws are now overturned. And that relies on the liberty interest from the 14th Amendment. And now we take the next step, which is our destination, same-sex marriage or marriage equality with Obergefell v. Hodges. Here, the Supreme Court said that states cannot prohibit same-sex marriage. They cannot fail to recognize same-sex marriages from other states because same-sex couples have and will walk back in time a right to privacy in their intimate relationships, which is based on women's reproductive rights and the rights to privacy, which is based on marriage as a fundamental right, which is based on gender and racial equality from the Civil Rights Act, from the 19th Amendment, right, and from the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which is based on the original Constitution and the Bill of Rights. In the United States, civil rights are all intertwined. Every vulnerable minority is part of this threading through the history of civil rights developing in the United States. So let's look at that development a little more. There are questions that will arise and are arising this week about where to from here. We are currently facing three battles in civil rights that we need to pay attention to. The first battle is voter suppression. Right? In voter suppression, there was pushback to the 15th Amendment, which is BIPOC people getting the right to vote. Right? And uh, Jim Crow laws were the way that people attacked those. So if you could criminalize regular daily behavior by people, you could use felony disenfranchisement, which means you take away the right to vote for convicts. Right? And that eliminates a bunch of people from the voting pool. There's also a real problem for not only people of color, uh, and women, but poor people everywhere, because we do not have a federal voting day. If you are working, you cannot get the day off to vote. We use voter dilution. We use voter ID requirements, right? We use gerrymandering to limit people's votes. This, these are pushbacks and legal strategies that are acceptable under the law, but if we all knew the legal system, I'm not sure they would be. So this is one of our main areas for civil rights struggles. Our next uh, simultaneous area that we're fighting is racial violence by police. This is the heart of the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And, and at the core of this problem is a legal doctrine called qualified immunity. This is a doctrine created by judges in cases. Remember I said that, that in a common law system like ours, judicial opinions can also create rules. This is one of those rules. And what it means is that police cannot be held liable for the harms they cause when they're performing their duties, right, except in all but the most egregious of circumstances. And often shooting somebody to death is not egregious enough under the law as we have it. Right? So, so qualified immunity is something that will take a lot of technical expertise and a lot of coordinated effort by everyone to move away from and solve. The third fight we're having simultaneously is increased discrimination against uh, BIPOC people, against women, and against LGBTQ folks. Right? So, so let's look at it like this. BIPOC people and women will face employment discrimination in a very intense way in failures to hire, right? in failures to promote, in limits to their salaries, in being paid less than other people. We, we theoretically do not have second-class citizenship, but in the employment world, we have all seen it. So this is intensifying uh, as we speak. When we, when we look at LGBTQ people, we just have to look at trans people to see that there are a host of civil rights attacks against them, right? Ranging from uh, 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 segregation and bathroom usage to criminalizing medical care and treatment. Now, the price of civil rights right, is suffering. That's the cost we pay to get our civil rights. We only advance civil rights, unfortunately and historically, when the suffering reaches an intolerable level in society. But with legal education, 
right? With legal action by people, we can avoid that suffering. We can make changes to the legal system before suffering reaches that level. Justice is not something that exists in nature. Justice is something that we create as human beings. We make it, we enforce it, and where there's injustice, we address it. The pathway to civil rights is legal education for all. As soon as we teach civics in schools, we should be teaching law. Law schools should be having certificate programs to train teachers at every level. But we need legal education not only in the school systems, we need legal education in the public. Even the police are not trained in the legal system. They know some criminal law. They know some criminal procedure. They know some evidence law. But they do not know the legal system. Nobody does unless you're part of this small, small group. And if they were enough to solve the problems, we would have solved them by now. So what I need you to do is get involved. I need you to pick whatever legal issue is closest to your heart and learn about it and empower yourself to take action to advance civil rights. Because quite simply, the future of civil rights depends on you. Shortly, the presence of civil rights is going to depend on five people, on five justices from our Supreme Court. The future of civil rights is going to depend on you and on all of us working together. And it will depend on legal education for all. Thank you.